Pragna Patel, who I think most of you know anyway. So we'll get straight on with Pragna's uh, presentation. Um. So anyway, so it's an absolute pleasure, honor, and, uh, and privilege to be here, uh, particularly in, the comp in, in such august company. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the situation in the UK in respect of religion, state, and the law. Um, and I've obviously, I can only talk about, or, or confidently talk about, my experiences in South or Black Sisters. Um, the first thing I want to say uh, when I reflect back on our work in the last five years, perhaps a decade or so, is that in the UK, uh, we at South or Black Sisters have become increasingly preoccupied with just one key question above all else, how to access justice on behalf of the most vulnerable. Um, and of course, access to justice has always been a central concern, given that we have long recognized the legal arena as a key site of feminist resistance. Um, we've used the law in a variety of ways to ensure that the most marginalized and vulnerable women that we work with can exercise their right to equality, to justice, to fairness in civil and criminal proceedings. And this has involved laying bare class, race, and gender norms in the law itself that reproduce inequality and legitimate exclusionary and discriminatory outcomes for minority women. The struggle to hold the law to account in that sense remains unfinished business, even though we have, together with others, made some significant gains along the way. But I think the struggle to access justice has now reached crisis point. The ever-widening shadow of neoliberalism and the rise and rise of fundamentalist religious identity politics has left us struggling on two interlinked fronts. First, we're absolutely compelled to challenge the state for removing legal aid from huge range of civil and criminal matters, which not only impact on individual rights, but also on our demands for institutional accountability in the face of abuses of power, which are actually growing and not diminishing. The government's so-called reforms on legal aid are strongly located in a fiscal context that reiterates some of the key overarching aims of the present government. Localism, alternative dispute resolution strategies, deficit reduction, and deregulation. Taken to make together, these measures are destroying one of the great pillars of the welfare state. They have forced us into leading or supporting legal and political challenges against legal aid cuts. But this development is significant for another reason. It's directly linked to the challenges we face on the second front, which is the increasing privatization of justice and state adoption of faith-based approach to address legal issues in minority communities. This has meant, amongst other things, challenging religious fundamentalism and moderates alike who seek to influence the law and social policy by reference to a regressive religious identity that they have come to define. So in the last few years in the UK, we've seen the rise in demand for the accommodation of religious legal codes in the very fabric of the legal system. Demands which parts of the state have, ha, um, have been only too happy to accommodate. These demands emanate from powerful Muslim spokespersons and institutions and can be directly linked to the growth of political Islam and more generally to the rise of fundamentalism in all religions. Muslim fundamentalists have, have mounted what I describe as a two-pronged pincer-like maneuver based on st ostensibly on the demand for religious tolerance but which is in reality a bid for power at the heart of which lies the control of female sexuality. On the one hand, they seek to ensure that personal religious codes are normalized within the legal system itself, and on the other, to formalize a parallel legal system through the establishment of alternative religious forums for dispute resolution, particularly in family matters. 
And this process I refer to as the shariafication by stealth of the legal apparatus involves making state law and policy Sharia compliant. And if it's successful, we have no doubt that it would lead other religions to demand the same level of accommodation. As secular black feminists, so what we have to contend with today echoes previous struggles that challenge multiculturalism and the left-leaning variant anti-racism. Whereas previously we challenged the anti-racist movement and official multiculturalism for abstracting notions of culture and for failing to deal with gender power relations, we now find ourselves challenging official multi-faithism, which has formalized communal identities and parts of the anti-racist and feminist movement itself, frankly, for abstract, abstracting notions of religion. To, and so let me give you some examples of what I mean by the shariafication by stealth of, so, of law and policy. First example, I'm sure these examples are well known to, to most of you. The end of 2012, against the growing practice of gender segregation at public events in universities, public, yes, um, um, events in universities, the Universities UK, which is the governing body of British universities, issued guidance which permitted gender segregation of women in university spaces in order to accommodate the religious be beliefs of external speakers. The guidance presented in the form of a case study purported to provide advice in contexts where the right to manifest religion clashes with gender equality. Far from addressing the question of what was frankly sex discrimination, the guidance merely legitimized gender apartheid. It took a campaign and threats of legal action before the UUK agreed to withdraw the guidance. And we argued that the UUK's guidance violated equality and non-discrimination principles enshrined, for example, in the public sector equality duty and other equalities and human rights legislations, which themselves are the product of long and hard campaigns by feminists, racial minorities, and other marginalized groups in society. Um, learning nothing from that debacle, the Law Society, my second example, a body that represents the interests of the legal profession, followed the UUK by issuing guidance to lawyers on how to prepare Sharia-compliant wills. And it was actually drafted, if you look carefully, with reference to Islamists who defend death by stoning, amongst other things, and, who, and the guidance endorsed so-called Sharia succession rules, which stipulate that as a general rule, a male heir will inherit twice the amount that a female heir will receive, and illegitimate children are not heirs. Apart from other discriminatory bits, that's the bit um, that really stands out. Clearly, the guidance accepts without question the inherent discrimination that exists in Islam, and indeed in other religions, um, against women, and against children born outside marriage. Quite apart from the fact that the law society cannot possibly know what is and isn't Sharia law, given that Muslim religious codes are varied and actually vigorously contested, as well as targeted for repeal throughout the world, the real problem, and this is the shocking part of it, is that the law society sees no wrong into wading into doctrinal, doctrinal territory. And much to our dismay, the guidance is part of a wider program of training courses developed by the Law Society to encourage Sharia compliance to the question of family, children, property, and financial settlements in minority communities. What we see operating, actually, is an inverse form of racism. Because far from promoting a rights-compliant culture, the Law Society is helping to arrest the development of a secular human rights culture from taking root in minority communities. And it's giving succor to Islamist demands for religious and secular laws to operate in parallel universes. So our struggle for the right to access a secular human rights framework is difficult. But it is made that much more difficult in a context where the government has also consistently invoked the need to uphold so-called British values, presumably meaning respect for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, even though in the same breath, 
It also threatens to repeat the Human Rights Act, especially every time a court seeks to assert the universal application of human rights in cases of state abuse of power. My third example, I have one minute, is of course, um, uh, in, in terms of concerns about the growing alignment of religion and the law, is state support for non-state religious arbitration systems. By removing legal aid, actually the state has forced minority women to resort to formal and informal religious authority and forums such as Sharia councils and tribunals, which appear to be on the increase. But what they're in fact seeking to do is to exclude the application of what is considered to be Western secular law, especially in family matters, and to establish instead a parallel legal system based on divine law, which by its very nature is immune from regulation and scrutiny. What's, what's alarming is that support for, separate, uh, for parallel legal systems come not only from male religious leaderships and from the state, but actually from parts of feminism itself and the left. And um, yet few of those feminists who support this acknowledge the fact that wherever parallel legal systems operate, they generally suppress dissent and seek to remove women from public spaces, metaphorically speaking, and to impede their fundamental freedoms in the private sphere. And they also do not acknowledge that there are substantial movements led by women and human rights activists for the repeal of state-sanctioned religious orders. Instead, notions of autonomy and female agency, the cornerstone of feminist analysis, are actually invoked to shore up a regressive multi-faith framework. I don't have time to go into a, a South Black Sisters study we did um, looking at women's use of Sharia councils and tribunals, except to say that um, many did not, uh, far from accessing these forums voluntarily, um, uh, um, exercised a highly constrained agency in contexts where the stranglehold of religion left them little room for maneuver. So I suppose what I should say, um, um, in just as concluding comments, that advocates for parallel legal systems argue that having recourse to religious forums does not mean that white minority women are seeking to opt out of the wider political community. Um, they argue that, that all they're seeking is the right to be governed by their own norms. But I think this position misses the point that women are choosing not to opt out at all. They are being opted out by the religious right and by the state. They're actually denied the tools they need to withstand pressures to conform to custom or to invo invoke a broader set of citizenship and human rights. And by doing so, they're denied the right to participate in the wider political community as citizens rather than as subjects. So what we see at work then is clearly an attempt to impede the development of secular, progressive political resistance by delegitimizing and locating our struggles for access to justice outside of so-called community anti-racist and feminist concerns. So our struggle actually is taking place on many fronts as both religious forces and the state amount an assault on secular human rights values in pursuit of power without accountability. Thank you.